So here we are uh, at the mountain cabin. Um, you may know this about me, but one of my dreams was always to be able to have a little getaway up in the mountains close to Asheville, and I've been fortunate enough to get to do that. Um, and so this is actually the view. We're looking out here at the mountains from the mountain house, and I love it up here. And one of the things that I noticed that's really interesting when we got this place about, uh, oh gosh, it's been several years ago now, is that there's a time of the year when these crazy stink bugs just fly around and they're just all over and they take over the place. There's this influx of stink bugs all of a sudden. And so maybe, you know, you've experienced the same thing. What causes this? Why is there all of a sudden at this one time of year this huge influx of population of certain bugs? And why when things reproduce, are there different strategies? We don't see all of a sudden a ton of monkeys being reproduced, but we do see in this example, these stink bugs which come around and plague herder at the mountain house. What's going on? Why are there so many bugs, but some animals have a different strategy where we only have one or two offspring? This video, we're gonna explain populations to you. Hopefully you'll understand the answer to that question at the end. So let's get started. So let's just take a little bit of a review on some basic ecology. You may remember that the biosphere is our planet that contains all life. Within the biosphere, we're divided into some ecosystems. So in this example, you're seeing the ecosystem of the desert. Within the ecosystem, you're going to see several communities. In this case, you see a community of meerkats and a community of plant life, right? So a community is all the populations together of living things and some of these abiotic factors that you see as well. Well, what makes up communities? Populations. In this example, you see a population of meerkats. So a population is just one group or species of organisms living in the same space at the same time. And so populations, of course, are made up of organisms. In this video, we want to focus here on populations. The focus of this video will talk about how species interact within a population. So, life takes place in these populations, as I mentioned, and here's the formal definition of population. It's just a group of individuals of the same species, maybe meerkats, in the same area at the same time. So, you've got some meerkats living in one desert, you might have some meerkats living in another desert, that's not the same population, because to be a population, you've got to be the same species living in the same area at the same time. And so here's a population of penguins, right? We see even a baby penguin there. And the thing about populations is that some interesting things take place. Life. Life takes place in populations. So what's life like? Well, in these populations, that means they're often, because they're in the same space at the same time, competing for the same resources. Populations also will interact with one another. And then maybe, most importantly, interbreed. So the population, in this case, population of penguins, will interbreed so that they can continue to pass genes into the next generation. So how do populations interact with our environment? That's also something we want to talk about in this video. So in this environment here, we've got a nice aquatic marine ecosystem environment going on. And there's, you know, fish floating around through our environment. And if you look around, there's lots of living things. There's also lots of non-living things. So we have biotic or living and a, anytime you put a in front of it, it means not. So abiotic, not living factors. Let's think about what those look like in this marine ecosystem. So in a biotic environment, the biotic part, the living part, of course, we see some prey. We also will see competitors 
competing for the same resources. You'll see some predators. If you got prey, you generally have predators. And then other living things that you might not notice are parasites and disease. Living, right? But not maybe noticeable right up front. In terms of abiotic factors in this marine ecosystem, non-living factors, these still contribute to the environment, but they're maybe not as noticeable. Things like the sunlight, if it makes it down into this um, ecosystem. The temperature of the water in this case is important. Or if you're talking about a land ecosystem, the temperature on land. Of course, in marine ecosystems, water is very important, right? These are all non-living things. And in this case, we also have some soil down there. So the difference between biotic and abiotic, living, non-living, all of these things must be taken into account when we're talking about interacting in our environment. So we got some fish here. That would fall under the biotic environment. Looks like, oh, we got a shark coming through. Maybe that's a predator. That's also under the biotic environment. Oh, looks like we got a little eel down there too. All of those examples that we saw interacting with this environment fall under the biotic. But don't forget, these can be just as important as well because they affect what can be in the environment. So how do we assign some characteristics to a population? When we talk about populations, we often talk about the range of the population. So I've got a prime example of a range for cheetahs. And if you look down here in Africa, you can see in the sort of southern part, you can see where there's a high density in red range, low range, and then where they used to sort of cheetahs roam. So this is the range of a population. We use that, and that's helpful to describe a certain population. In this case, the population of cheetahs. We've talked about cheetahs in previous videos before. We know there was a bottleneck that occurred, and cheetahs have very little diversity. They used to wander around a lot, but they've pretty much been confined to these areas now. Another way we talk about populations is in how they space. And this one's really interesting to me, because it's about density and spacing. Um, and so I've got three patterns you can sort of see. You see one up there, you got one here in the middle, and then one on the bottom. This top one you can see is what we call a uniform pattern distribution. So do you see how all these organisms or individuals are uniformly spaced apart from each other? So an example of this would be the penguins. Here you see some penguin chicks. Um, and they, like penguins, are notorious for individual spacing. They want to be uniformly spaced from each other. Um, and this often has to do with territoriality. So any animals that are really territorial, we see that a lot in the bird groupings, um, they're going to have a uniform spacing. Now here, can you find a pattern in this? Uh, it's kind of hard to find a pattern there. That's because it's random. So another example of a spacing pattern is random. And we see a lot of this in the plant world. Think about a dandelion, how um, the dandelions uh, are moved and the seeds move and they become, um, into the, the, they become planted into the ground and these dandelions pop up everywhere. That's random dispersal. So there's no really order to that. It's just kind of random depending on the way, literally the way the wind blows. And then, in this last example, you might see, oh, okay, I see some a definite pattern. These are clumped together. So we call that the clumped pattern. So this we see a lot, if you think of schools of fish clumping together, um, other pack animals clumping together. So you see these three, one, two, three spacing patterns that we see common in populations. Now, an interesting question might be, well, what are humans? Where do humans fall in this spacing pattern? I think you could make a case for a lot of these. We, we certainly like our space and our territory, right? Uh, especially people in the United States. We're, we, we have personal space issues for sure. Um, and then some would say we're random, right? You find random people living in random places around the world. Um, but then there's an argument to be made about us grouping together into clumps or cliques even, uh, groups, packs even that you might say to, um, for human spacing. So maybe the answer is we're a little bit of all of them. And then the third way we might 
popu um, describe a population is in the size of the population. Um, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. So range, spacing, and size. So how do size, how does the size of a population change and what impacts the population size? Well, if you think back, if you think down to it, it's, it's pretty simple really. There are a few things, and I'm going to list four, that will affect a population size. So here's my um, population of birds. One thing that might affect it is birth. All right? If you have a bird, lays a bunch of eggs, you got some new baby birds, those are all going to add to the population. So this increases population size. Death, then, see a snake come in. Oh, that's scary. And then, oh, uh, bird's dead. That subtracts from a population. Birth adds to a population size. Death subtracts from a population size. Pretty easy to understand at this point. The other things that can happen to a population are immigration and emigration. So you think immigration, think coming into, right? A bird flies in, it's added to the population. Emigration, think exiting from the population. A bird decides, oh, I've had enough of the view birds, and then they leave. So these are the factors that affect population size. And in a subsequent video that you will watch later, um, I talk about all of the formulas that are used to calculate population size, and you've got to take these into account. So how do we measure population density? In other words, besides the formulas, how do we go out and actually count the size or the density of a population? So there's a few ways scientists do this if we want to count a certain population. One, if the population's really small, we can just count the number of individuals, right? If the size, if the range is small, we just go and count the number of individuals. However, what if you've got a large area and you're counting something really small, right? Maybe you're counting some bugs in a and you want to know how many bugs are in this entire ecosystem or something, or this entire um, plot of land. Well, one thing we can do is measure just a certain area, count the number in this area, and then if I know there are roughly oh, four in this area, I can just use some math and figure out how many are in the total based on what we find in one particular area. So that's a way of estimating now, of course, we do know that some areas are more prone to have certain species than others. So there are some natural flaws in that, but that is one way we can estimate the size of a population by counting in one specific area and then it's sort of extrapolating outwards. Um, populations can be tricky to count as well. Um, let's say I gave you an assignment where you had to count those fish. Well, that's hard to do. That's hard to do because they're moving, right? Once you count one, it's moved to a different place. You can't can't count it. So how do scientists count like things like fish, things that are constantly moving? Well, thanks to some mathematicians, we've developed what's called the mark and recapture method, where we capture some, all right, so we take some fish out or some snails or something, and then we mark them to know that we've caught that one. Then we put them back in the certain area. Same thing we can do with birds. Then we go again, or we capture again. Some, some of them, though, will be recaptures. So if we capture a group, a percentage of that group will be ones that we have recaptured. And then using the mathematicians, some fancy um, equations, we can actually estimate pretty well the total population based on the number that we recaptured when we um, did this mark and recapture method. So those are a few ways that we actually go out and count and measure population density. So this whole thing about reproduction and birth, there are actually some trade-offs to consider. So reproduction comes at a cost, right? there is a cost to reproduction. And so increasing reproduction in a species may actually decrease the survival of that particular individual that's doing the reproducing. And you've got to invest so much in the offspring 
And if you think about, especially think of primates and humans, there's only a few times we're limited in the number of offspring we, we can produce in our lifetime. So there are some trade-offs. Obviously, the more reproduction that occurs, you're going to have more organisms, more population. But the more you are reproducing, the lower the expectancy um, for survival of that individual. So nature has shown us that there are actually a few different strategies that organisms take. We call these the reproductive strategies. Two types are K-selected and R-selected. And my way to remember this is when I think K, I think care. I know they start with different letters. But K, care. These organisms put a lot of care into their offspring. R, their strategy is to reproduce, reproduce, lots and lots lots of babies. So here are what these mean. K selected, we generally see a later reproduction in life, right? So you don't, we don't have babies giving birth to babies in case-selected species, so they reproduce later in life. And it's just a few offspring, and they put a lot of effort into raising those offspring. And of course, who are you thinking about? Us, primates, yeah? Um, we, like our friends um, in, the, in the monkey group, they have few offspring, but they put a lot of effort into raising those offspring, okay? So the strategy for survival is more about survival and investment in the this than it is about having a ton of them. And another really interesting one to me is actually the coconut. Think about how long and how much effort is put into raising a coconut so that it can, of course, make new coconut trees. Um, there's a lot. So coconuts are also case selected. A lot of care, a lot of time is going, goes into just having a few offspring. Well then, what's the other strategy? Early reproduction, many offspring, little parental care. And when we think of this, this is when those darn stink bugs that plague me uh, really appear. Insects are prime R selectors. So you can see here all the eggs and all these stink bugs that are kind of come and fly at me. Lots of offspring, reproduce early, and you don't see mom and daddy stink bug taking care of baby stink bugs. Doesn't happen, right? Same thing with dandelions. A lot of plants are also R selected. They're just letting their seeds, their pollen float into the air and hoping as many for as many offspring as possible. So those are the two different strategies that populations take for reproduction. K is about care, R is about reproduction. And then when we think about how the growth then occurs, I wanna give you a little precursor into an upcoming video on how we measure this. There's really two models that show population growth. The first is exponential. Think back to math class and think about exponents and think about exponential growth, right? Bacteria, prime example. Bacteria grows exponentially, which is reproduction without constraints. One bacteria becomes two, two become four, right? It's exponents. Four becomes 16 when they all divide because bacteria reproduce by dividing. And so without any limiting factors, in this case, the only limiting factor is the amount of auger in the plate or the plate itself, this um, bacteria is going to grow out of control exponentially. You're going to see major takeoff. We see this often when a new environment is introduced. You take a bacteria, you plop it on a, a buffet of um, macromolecules for it to enjoy. That bacteria is going to take off and grow. You take a uh, non-native species and introduce it into a population without limiting factors, it's going to grow like crazy. Now, the other growth pattern is what we call logistical growth, and that's what you see here with this darker red line. That is, there's growth in a population until it kind of levels out, meaning this is the maximum that the population can sustain. Fur seals, we got a prime example of that. There's been a lot of studies done on how there's a certain number of seals that can really stay in an ecosystem. If it gets beyond that, the whole system collapses. And so we call this logistical growth because there's some logistics which 
inhibit that, that exponential growth in those organisms. And so hopefully this uh, video helped you understand the differences between how these organisms reproduce and some of these strategies. And maybe now you understand why all the bugs appear at one time and they might be attacking you, whereas other animals don't take that strategy. So population, population growth, hopefully you understood a little bit about that in this video. If you enjoyed this or if you learned something, be sure to like and share this video to continue more videos being made.